Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Short passage, so lock in really quick. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, which is what they should have done as lepers, because you're not allowed to come in contact with anyone if you had that cursed disease. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, so notice they did, so all 10 of them did, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He wasn't whispering. He wasn't mumbling his lips praising God, like some of us are accustomed to do, myself included. He didn't do that. He praised God with a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet, and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So he's doubly dead. He has a double, double, the double disease. Not only was he physically dying and dead and ostracized, he was socially dead and ostracized because he was of that accursed Samaritan race which the, the people at that time were racist toward. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. One of the ugliest words in all of the English language is the word ungrateful. Now we use that and we use it mostly with kids. Because adults to adults, we won't listen to someone call us ungrateful because you want to know why? Most of us don't know we're ungrateful when we're ungrateful. And when someone comes to us and approaches us, perhaps that we should submit in the spirit of humility to, to some truth that's being spoken over us about ingratitude, we usually start to think of the times when we weren't. Well, no, 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 that's not the case. Last year I volunteered at the soup kitchen. And remember, I gave that guy 10 bucks. And, and, I, and I sacrificed all my time so that she could go here and he could, and we start to think and then we start to work up a sort of a spiritual resume in our mind. And then we say, no, they're wrong. I'm not ungrateful. That's why people who are ungrateful hardly know they are when they are. It's the same thing with greed. Have you ever heard anyone say, these are sins that you don't know you're doing when you're doing them. No one uh, is surprised when they're ripping off a 7-Eleven and they say, you were stealing. And you say, I was? Or, you know, committing adultery. No one's going to say, oh, you're not my wife. I didn't, know, I didn't know that. That doesn't happen. These are ones you know you're do, you don't know you're doing it when, you, when you're, that's your condition. And so we're loath to listen. And what you have here is a story in Luke 17 about ungratefulness. That's the opposite of grateful and being thankful. Those are two different things. Because as I, I wrote in my notes, um, grateful, grateful is a condition of the heart. Giving thanks is an action from the heart. And it's, it's like Luke, my son, uh, we, we, you know, really after him to say prayers before prayer, a prayer before me, our meal, and it's real simple. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest and let this food to us be blessed. And I don't think he's done it on his own once in about 10 years. And so he said to me the other night, he goes, Dad, why do I do that? What's wrong with me? And he kind of hits his head like that. And I was, now I followed it up with grace, but I was spiritually honest with him. I said, you want to know why? The real reason? And it's not going to feel good. And he goes, what? I said, because God's not that important to you. If it was important, you'd do it. You know, if it was an Xbox game, he'd be all over it. If it was a device, he wouldn't miss a beat. But we typically are very attentive to the things that are important to our hearts and that we're grateful for and we're not attentive or thankful for the things that are not important to our heart. It's basically that simple. Now, I followed it up with some grace later on with him. So just so you know, like, gosh, he talks to his kids like that? You know, I told you I'm a terrible counselor. That's why I don't know why any of you want appointments with me. Um, A couple things, too. As I was reading this text this afternoon, I, I, I read a quote from a, a pastor. He says, unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. It's not enough for your heart to feel grateful if it's unexpressed 
gratitude, that communicates in gratitude. Think of relationships. Think of your mom or dad or sister or wife slaving over Thanksgiving dinner and we are completely and utterly oblivious to the work that she's done, to the sweat beating down her face and she has to call us down and then when when we, we eat, we're disrespectful and then we just run off. And then we could see that mom's a little bit upset and stupid husband says, goes and says, honey, what's wrong? It's like, you are husband and all of you, these little people, you're what's wrong. But unexpressed gratitude communicates what? Ingratitude and it starts to kill relationships. I wish I could go into more of that with you. It's in my notes, but I can't because we got to stay to the text. So what happens is that Jesus has 10 lepers that approach him. He cures all 10. Only one gets healed. And I, I believe this is one of the only instances where Jesus heals them after they reach out to him. So, you know, the woman who touched his cloak, she was healed in the act of reaching out to him. These guys are healed after he says, go and show yourselves to the priests, which would prove them to be ritualistically clean and they could go back into society. And it says, but on their way, they were made clean. And only one out of the ten comes back. Now, why is that? I think it's our spiritual sickness to know that when we are saved, we forget the fact that we needed to be saved to begin with. That when we're saved, we think, oh, life gets to go back to normal. Look at I'm back into society now. You're one of these lepers. Life goes back to normal. I could start taking my vitamins again. I could start going to church again. I'm going to start exercising. Life goes back to normal. And there's an Ethiopian proverb that says, a man that is well forgets about God. Because now I'm back on track. Suffering was an interruption to my plans. Now I'm not suffering anymore. I'm not diseased. I don't have that obstruction. Now I could kind of kick God to the curb, and I'm back on track with my plans. That's my guess with what the nine thought. Because it's, you have a life-threatening illness and a socially ostracizing illness, and you don't stop and say, let us go back and thank him. Why? Because there's a, there's a, there's a spirit of ingratitude that's working in those hearts. And they probably didn't even know they were ungrateful. And only one turns around. And like I said earlier, he was doubly bad in the society's eyes. He was a Samaritan. And notice what he does. And I want you to watch, pay attention because we're going to pay attention because we're taking a turn here. And you've got to pay attention in the turns or you'll fall out of the truck. So here's what happens. He goes back and he does a couple things and I want you to pay close attention. He falls at Jesus' feet. You don't fall at the feet of another man. Even in the book of Revelation, when an angel appears to the apostle John and John falls at his feet and the angel says, no, don't do that. You only do that for God. And you know what's amazing? This man falls at Jesus' feet and what does Jesus not do? He doesn't say, don't do that. In other words, what is this man caught on to first and foremost that his cure was not by the hand of just a magician or just some faith healer, that there was something that goes goes way deeper into the heart of who this man is that that didn't just cure him, that healed him. What do you mean by the distinction between curing and healing? It says he fell at his feet and he thanked him. And I looked at the Greek and it meant, the the phrasing in the original language meant it's it's a repetition of thanks. It's not just, hey, thanks. It's not that. It, it says he fell at his feet. It's literally he collapsed in worship and was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Does your heart do that with Jesus Christ? Because we're all leprous. We all have the disease of sin. We're all broken in relationship to God. Our hearts are all cattywampus in relationship to him. And what does he do? He comes and he brings us wholeness and pureness. And all his promises are yes and amen. And this crushed spirit, he makes whole again. And then do we just go back to everyday life? This text is so important because guess what we're going to do? We're going to hear a word like tonight and you're going to go back tomorrow into what? Everyday life. Are you going to be the nine or are you going to be the returner? Are you a returner or are you the other nine? That's why this text is biting. And if you're not getting bit, probably means your heart isn't open to what God wants to speak to it, which is a serious spiritual sickness. 
because this is biting me. And Jesus says in response to his worship and his thanks, he says, he says three things, three questions. Were not all ten cleansed? And you can almost hear the sadness in his voice. Where are the other nine? That was his second question. Where did they go? Why aren't they here? Where are the other nine? Is the only one, third question, that's returned to give thanks to God as this foreigner? And then do you know what Jesus says to him? Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The actual translation, you could, inter- you could translate it this way. Rise and go. Your faith, because it made you well, thanks, yeah, your faith healed the leprosy. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying rise and go. You could translate that Greek word sozo, which translates as well. Rise and go. Your faith has healed you. You weren't just cured. You were healed. Ten guys went to Jesus for a cure. One got healed. And as I said every time I preach on this text, wouldn't it be a crying, stinking shame to meet Jesus Christ and to have his touch upon my heart and to come away only with physical wellness. What a crying shame. Because those other nine guys, their bodies were all going to go to at some point. But this guy, this guy was different. And so the question is, are you one of the nine or are you a returner? And the difference between the two is only eternity. That's the only difference, real minor Guys, be a returner. Jesus Christ is asking you, you were in church. You were praising me. I touched your heart. I felt the response. You know, I wanted to reach out and touch, touch you. And you just went home. You're, you, you, you settled for the cure. You settled for the thing that's transient. You settled for the thing that's temporary. Be the returner. And you know what else? That guy, that Samaritan leper who was cure, cured and healed, came back, and guess, we're, guess who we're still talking about 2,000 years later as a model for faith? A Samaritan leper, the bottom of the bottom, the only way he could have got any lower is if, if his, in that culture is if he was a woman. And by the way, Jesus had plenty of those around him too. Isn't that funny? The people at the bottom are far more open than people that are upper middle class to see that they need light and they need joy and they need his peace if there's going to be any way out, if there's any liberation, it's going to have to come from outside of me. Isn't that interesting? So how I like the joke. The people that get the gospel message about Jesus Christ saving us, we can't save ourselves. In my experience, through pastoring and counseling and in the military, guess who gets it the quickest? The addicts do. They understand, boom, right now, I can't save myself. It has to be some other power. And when that power comes and touches their heart, they get it. But don't you realize, sin, we're all addicts. (laughs) We're all addicts. We're all addicts to selfish ambition and selfish desire. I wanted to share um, a prayer with you and close. And then we're going to take communion, and um, we'll have a benediction at the end, and We'll send you on your way, I hope, as a returner. And um, this is, I've read this before, but I think this is what the other nine should have prayed. And it's a poem by John Donne, who's a 17th century Christian poet. And it's a poem, but it's a prayer to God. And this is how he opens this prayer. And I would challenge, myself included, any pastor I met, any Christian who says, oh yeah, I follow the Lord, I dare you to pray this prayer then. Because this takes gumption and this takes courage because if Jesus Christ actually follows through, that means you're going to go through major life adjustment and change if he answers this prayer. And if you're open to his spirit, he will. This is how it begins. Batter my heart, three-personed God, Trinity. Batter my heart, beat me up, punch me in the face spiritually. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you, 
as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. He says, I know you want to mend me and make me whole, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me and bend your force, break, blow, burn, make me new, but I, like a usurped town, to another do. In other words, he's saying I'm like a town taken over by an enemy and I belong, I don't belong to you right now. So you gotta beat me up. Labor to admit to you, but oh no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend. But my heart is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would love and will be loved fain. But I love this line, he says, but Lord, I am betrothed unto your enemy. I have an engagement ring to evil. A heart like that, Jesus Christ is listening and he's like, you, my friend, are open. You are a returner. I can work with that sculpted soft clay that says, I'm lost without you. So he says, I'm betrothed to your enemy. His next line, so divorce me. Untie, break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except that you enthrall me, shall never be free, nor ever whole, except you ravish me. Pray that prayer. He'll answer it if your heart's open. Also, when you leave today, here's the challenge. I put a Thanksgiving prayer back there. So if you're at your Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow, and they're like, oh, you know, Cousin Julie's here, Uncle Bob, and, you know, he really doesn't like the church. Thumb your nose at him, take this piece of paper and say, why don't we all pray and be salt and light in the midst of maybe some environments that you're dreading to go into tomorrow? Because sometimes Thanksgiving isn't joyful. It's like I have to go into and be face-to-face with these people for a long time. And, that, you know, it's like one long episode of Everybody Loves Raymond or Christmas Vacation. And it's like... Gee, doesn't this look great? No, but go in. Emmanuel Lutheran Church is commissioning you as a missionary to go into those environments and be salt and be light and be a person of prayer. So there's a sheet back there with a Thanksgiving prayer. And all you gotta say, hey, let's pray. And if no one wants to join you, I'm sure a couple will. Do it yourself. And the Holy Spirit will go with you and will give you words that your enemies can't even disagree with or can't fight against. Thank you, Father. We give you thanks. Not only we give you thanks for food, home, family, and friends, which is what everyone says, and they're good things, we give you thanks above that, something deeper than that, something infinitely more important than that, something eternally more important than that. We give you thanks that we could fall at your feet, know that you're God, give you thanks, and know that you have saved us, that we can't save ourselves, and in you we have light, in ourselves we have dark, in you we have forgiveness, in ourselves we have condemnation, in you we have life, in ourselves we have death, and so we thank you that all the work is finished, that Jesus, what you've done for us. So I pray that that would be impressed upon our hearts, that it would be real to our hearts, that it would be clear to our hearts, that that would have color in our hearts, and that it would spill out and overflow into those that need his healing and his forgiveness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.